Hello again, my name's Tony Hilliard. Today I'm going to show you one way to repair the seats in your Model A Ford. This is not intended to be a video on how to install replacement seats or covers. On my 1928 Tudor sedan, I believe she had replacement seat covers in the early 1970s. As far as I can make out, they were not replaced as per original fabric, but as a usable, tidy interior, a driver. Those replacement seat covers have suffered from what I'm sure is moth and mouse damage, as you will see from the pictures that follow. Certainly, if the money were available, I could have simply ordered a new set of professionally made period covers, but that option is not always available to everyone. So, this is my take on an alternative solution to repair damaged seat facings. I hope you find it useful. This is our 1928 Model A Tudor sedan. It's an early one with a parking or emergency brake on the left hand side. This photograph was taken a few years ago for a photo shoot. The Thompson gun, by the way, is made of plywood. This is the interior. First impression, it looks reasonably tidy. When you look at the back seat, you start to see the problems. See the small holes everywhere where the moths have got to it. When you start to look at the bottom where the back joins the base, you can really see what's been going on. This is after the seat has been removed from the car. Pretty horrible, really. Once the seats have been removed from the car, turn it upside down, and the first thing to do is to start removing the staples that hold everything together. I have a staple remover, which turned out to be completely useless. In the end, I had to use an electrical screwdriver. If anybody knows of a, a staple remover that actually works, I'll be very pleased to hear from them. Once the staples have been carefully removed, it's a case of uh, the side panels of the seats away from the base. Now I want to try and use these original panels again. As I say, this is a, a repair of the seat facings. It's a, it's a very strange situation. The moths don't seem to have touched anything but the, the top lighter colour. The, the grey the gray on the side of the seats matches the, the side panels in the doors and the headlining. And to try and match that grey would be extremely difficult. So hence the idea to try and repair the face panels. I'm doing this very carefully because I want to see if there's any other inhabitants in this top wadding just to see where they came from, where they're nesting. Uh, obviously I've got to clear this out thoroughly otherwise I'll repair the covers put them back on and the moths will start again the white padding material I'm going to throw away and burn but I want to try and retain that green material we're going to need to to take the seat cover apart completely because I want to use them as patterns that you need a special tool an unpicker and for this purpose I decided to use my head mounted magnifying glass makes life much easier a tedious job but necessary. We want to try and get this off as in one piece if we can. Where you've tried to get the staples out, it's worth going around with a hammer to flatten them all down, make sure they, you don't ca carve your hands up. This is what we've ended up with. A piece we're going to use a pattern. As you can see, it's absolutely rotten. But is there anything still living in there? We've got to find a way of making sure there isn't. My solution was to try and fumigate them. My wife wasn't using her greenhouse during the summer, so I thought that's the perfect place to do it. I put the seats and the seat frames and all the padding in the greenhouse and used a sulfur candle for, so if it kills bugs and things in greenhouses, why not kill the bugs in my seats? As you can see from this photograph, it's like a, a grey mist in there. Truly horrible stuff. I did use tracing paper to make a pattern with our fumigated seat cover, lay it out, mark all the centers, mark where you want the pleats to be. Then I did some research and discovered every time you put a pleat in, you're going to reduce the overall length by three millimeters or an eighth of an inch. This was on the video by sailright.com. Oh, well worth having a look at that. Very helpful, very instructional video. So once I calculated how many pleats I'm having, I think I had 10. So let's say three millimeters or an eighth of an inch per pleat. 10 pleats, three millimeters a time, that's 30 millimeters. So to get the pattern the right length, 
I had to put in a 30 millimeter strip of paper. We want to double check we find the, the center point again, very important a little bit later. Enjoyable part, get the new material out, lay it nice and flat, spread it uh, no bumps, creases, etc. Then we're going to lay the pattern on top, weight the corners down so it lays flat, and then we're going to cut out the, uh, the pattern. Once we've got our top material cut out, we're going to cut out the foam. It's called scrim, a closed cell foam with mesh of nylon bonded to it to strengthen it. It also means once we've got the, all the top fabric glued to the foam with the nylon mesh on the outside, it means when you're sewing it, the stitching doesn't pull through the foam. We want to find the center point again, halfway point with the top material foam scrim. Once we know our center point, the halfway, we're going to be able to mark up the foam so when we want to stitch our pleats into position, we get nice, even, straight lines. The object of the exercise is to try and make the back of the seat and the base of the seat so all the seams line up. As you can see with the scrim, the side with the nylon mesh on is slightly lighter in color. Now we need to glue the top fabric onto the foam scrim. I've covered this table with plastic sheeting to stop the glue going everywhere. And I did a lot of research on this. There are lots of cheap kit aerosol glues and they are high in solvent and low in, in solids. So when you spray them on, the solvent goes straight through the foam onto the back of the material and then straight through the material and you get terrible stains everywhere. We're using this 3M Super 77 spray adhesive. It's expensive, but it's really good. Fold it halfway, give it a good shake, spray it everywhere over the material. Make sure you get it where the join is halfway. Put it over, it gets nice and tacky. It stays tacky for a little while so you can smooth it flat. Turn it round, fold it back, make sure you spray well into that joint. You don't want any marks halfway along the, the top. Make sure you don't over spray onto the nice material. Put a plastic under that. Smooth it all down. starting to look good. Now I left this overnight to make sure the adhesive had cured properly and this is the result. Very pleased with that. Now we're going to mark up the back. That's the nylon mesh side so that we can do our stitching on the sewing machine to create our pleats.
Doesn't look very hygienic, my licking the pencil. This is a China Graph pencil. If you use on foam things like a spirit-based felt tip pen, you'll find high risk of the solvent and the ink from the felt tip pen bleeding through into the material. So you make a lovely job of this and then find the uh, marker pen has bled through and marked the, the um, material. So use um, something like a China Graph and China Graph marks uh, works better if it's slightly damp. Right, start marking our lines. Just check the other side, make sure there's no marks, no bubbles, no, make sure the adhesive is adhered correctly. And we're ready to start thinking about using some sewing. Now this is a, um, a small piece of foam, an offcut, and a material. I glued these together exactly the same way as that, left it overnight, just to do a test piece, because I wanted to make sure we got these, the tension on the sewing machine correct, and to see what it looked like, whether it's better to use white thread or black thread. Well, white thread one. And uh, after I've done a couple of goes with a test piece, got the tension right, the length of stitch right. Quite pleased with that. Now we start the real job. Awkward to manipulate large pieces of semi-flexible foam. I've had this faff industrial sewing machine for some years and as always after I bought it I realized I should have bought one with a walking foot. Now a walking foot, how um, sewing machines work, they have what they call dogs like a serrated panel underneath which pulls the material through. Um, that's fine for ordinary thin fabric. With something as thick and as awkward as foam or, or something much thicker, um, ideally you want dogs or, or, or um, serrated feet pulling the fabric through the machine on the top and on the bottom. While the top mounted um, system for pulling things through is called a walking foot. And this is what I should have bought in the first place, but you live and learn, don't you? So on this machine, it, it, uh, on ordinary fabrics, it works beautifully, but on the foam that I'm sewing now, you have to actually pull or help the uh, machine pull the fabric and the foam through the machine. So hence I seem to be making a, a lot of effort in it. That's because the I'm helping the machine to operate. We make sure we do a, a few stitches, then back it reverse it and then try it again. This stops the thread uh, coming undone. Starting to look good. Now I'm just marking out and cutting some strips of vinyl to put on the back edges or the lower edges of the seats. So we machine these on and then uh, makes a neater and easier job when you're using the stapler to uh, to fix the material to the to the base again same principle awkward to awkward to work purely because of the size of it again I'm helping it through the The sewing part of the machine, as we we only have the uh, the dogs, the feed dogs underneath, and not the walking foot. Now we're going to fold it over, and we're going to run another seam right along the edge to really make sure it's a strong job. It also looks nice too.
Right, that's looking good. I'm going to trim the end of the vinyl off. Next job is to put the piping and the side grey panels on, or grey side panels on. This is the secret weapon for putting piping on. You change the foot on the sewing machine for a piping foot, and as you can see, there are channels underneath. And what happens is you set it in the right channel, and literally the sewing, sewing machine will follow the piping. It's as easy as that. You, you wouldn't believe how easy it is. Now I'm putting the uh, rough edge of the piping along the edge of the fabric on the top. Um, the actual piping works out at about um, an half an inch or 12 millimetres from the edge. I want to do that parallel all the way along. Fiddly on the corners, but again it's a matter of practice. Teach yourself as you go. Only need to do a little bit of a time. You don't want to rush about. The slower you do it, the more careful you do it, the better the result. Then machine over the nice final strip and reverse it to make sure the, the uh, thread is secured correctly. Make sure you trim all the ends off nicely. Now we're going to put the grey side panels on. As I say, this is much easier than you imagine. Once you've, you've got it in position, I'm going to put the, the grey panel again on the edge of the top panel. So it's literally, and you plonk the, uh, the piping foot on top of the piping and start stitching and the piping foot follows the piping and as I say it's much easier than you imagine. The staining on there by the way because this grey material I'm pretty certain is wool and I didn't want to try and clean it while it was disassembled what I plan to do is sew it all back together then clean it with a special foam cleaner um, obviously can't leave it dirty like that and it, di it does look dirty but with this um, foam cleaner I've got, it really makes a nice job. I've been using it for years. Again, we're coming up to the corner. You have to stop, carefully fold the grey material over on itself so you, you don't trap any excess material. Proceed it slowly, take a machine a little bit, fold it over carefully, a little bit more, fold it over carefully to get around the, the corner nicely. As this is going to be the front corner of the back seat, the last thing you need is, is ripples and folds, etc., where you've machined it badly. Another little tip, make sure you've got plenty of thread on the bobbin underneath. The last thing you need is uh, you get halfway along something like this and it runs out of thread.
There we are, that's what she looks like. That's on the inside. Turn it inside out. Nice and secure, nicely stitched. And that's the result, the type of result we're trying to achieve. Once we've got that fitted back on with the, the filling underneath and she's stretched and stapled, that's going to look very nice. This is our freshly fumigated seat base. I've cleaned the excess of the old white padding off. Now this um, wadding, cut this rough, roughly to size. This is what they call a hog ring. Hog ring pliers, it's a bit of a mouthful. But the, the special pliers, you open them up, slot the hog ring in, and it's uh, a metal ring that's left open. You put it into position, usually clamp it around one of the springs, squeeze the pliers, and it fits the, the wadding at the top. Now, just going to start putting this in position. The high-tech clamp system, I was watching one of the videos of um, the lovely lady from Clastique, and she had a similar arrangement to this, which is, once you've seen it done, it's pretty obvious. But of course, if you've never seen it, how the hell do you compress a mass of springs to get the tension right once you've put the fabric on? This is the air stapler I've had for a while. I used on my 28 Roadster. Very good tool. Now this is the the base of the, one of the front seats. I've cut this wadding out again. Exactly the same principle as the, the back seat. You can see we've got the new top material, the old grey. Again, the clamp. One little tip here is to make sure you space the clamp away from the actual base of the seat. So when you're fitting the grey material, you can fit the grey material under the clamp. Again, I usually start at the front. Very gently. So this, this is pre-used material, but it's immensely strong. I'm staggered how strong it is. So it is possible to reuse the, the side material. Again, you want a nice smooth result. You don't want any kinks or folds. You need to fold the corners down where the, you've made slits in the vinyl, where the iron work on the, the base of the seat, where the hinge goes through, you have to make a couple of slits. And you've got to fold the vinyl round those hinge pieces. Again, keep a similar tension on the vinyl as you did on the, the grey side material. Unwind our high-tech clamp. Works extremely well. There we are, we're getting there. Starting to look as it should. This is the end result. Gonna look all right, I think. Now underneath there is a what looks like a hardboard panel that has to be stapled back into position. Now this is the back of the front seat. Exactly the same principle. Stitch the new panel in. The fiddly bit is stapling the vinyl back into position. In seat frame there is a strip of wood, and you've got to fold the vinyl over so you don't get a raw edge. 
get a nice folded edge and then you've got to staple into that wooden strip inside the seat back. Going to fold the grey cloth in behind the seat hinges. You might have to just tidy that up and uh, hand sew that in to get it to look nice. This is the aerosol foaming upholstery cleaner I've been using. It is magic. Ambersil Auto Groom. Sadly, I don't get any sponsorship, but you've got to pass a good tip on. That's the before. This is the after. Again, the grey material I've cleaned with the amber sill. The reason I didn't want to do it when it was in pieces is because I was worried about shrinkage. I hope you found that helpful. Until next time, cheerio!